I will start with an overview of what writing in academic English entails, what it demands, and both why and how it differs from academic writing in Russian. I do so because I strongly believe that all Russian university professors of English, starting with the student's first year at university, must teach this information and stress its importance within the context of English language skills. What I propose right from the start is that all Russian professors of English introduce their students to the linguistic theory of contrastive rhetoric. The idea that the approaches to both reading and writing in different linguistic communities set up very different sets of expectations among their readers. Each community tends to believe that its way of thinking and presenting ideas is reasonable and logical, and that everyone else's is either strange, inferior, or both. One American prejudice, for example, is that European and Russian scholars theorize too much and are sloppy in the way they present data and conclusions. One European prejudice, for example, is that we Americans lack intellectual curiosity and are too positivistic and too simplistic in our thinking. Both these prejudices and many, many others come out of assuming that the way one does things in one's own linguistic community is the right way and therefore the only way to do these things, and neither group is right or wrong. So when I speak today of cultural differences, I am referring specifically to differences in the linguistic culture, in the ways that people of a specific language or language group tend to expect their speakers or writers to organize their presentation and expect their writers to organize and present their ideas. And it is these specific differences and how Russian universities can help their scholars understand and overcome them, and thus eventually get published in top international journals that I am here to discuss. That each linguistic community has its own culturally determined conventions for and approaches to writing is a given. These differences range from what an introduction needs to contain to what voice, active or passive, the culture gives most intellectual weight to whether an author may use the word I to take credit for a new theory or method. They also range from whether the writer should completely uh, be completely explicit about everything to give the reader all of the information, or whether the writer should assume a great deal of common knowledge on the part of the reader and therefore give the reader very little of those specifics. These examples of unwritten cultural and rhetorical rules barely scratch the surface. Basically, no matter what the subject of the research or theorizing, a paper in English must be sufficiently clear, concise, focused, and stylistically appropriate for an international publication to accept it. The key to good writing in English is clarity of language and clarity of focus. And by focus, I mean clarity of organization and structure according to very strict Anglo-American norms. Unfortunately, many Russian academics erroneously believe that adjusting their style for the English-speaking market would somehow diminish the scholarly quality of their writing because the straightforwardness of the English style doesn't fit the Russian style to which they are accustomed. For example, the brilliant, hardworking students in the Global Science Project, being justifiably proud of the wonderful Russian literary, scientific, academic traditions, challenged me on every point in which good academic writing in English differs from good academic writing in Russian. One morning, I explained that the mark of the intellectual in English is the person who can say the most in the fewest words and show them how to shorten phrases that have no content, for example, due to the fact that to be cause, or in view of the above, to therefore. One participant said, and I quote, we are taught in Russian that our sentences should have beautiful words and style. We think that our English writing should also sound beautiful, and these long phrases sound beautiful to us. Why shouldn't we use them? 
as all the students agreed with her, I had to think fast. So I handed them three paragraphs from a paper by an Israeli political scientist who was also a superb stylist in English. They were deeply impressed with his writing and said they wished they could write that one. I then asked whether any of the non-content phrases we've been discussing had appeared in any of his sentences. They looked paragraph by paragraph, but found none. So I then asked, now do you believe me when I say that good writing in English is about using content vocabulary well in a variety of sentence structures, not just using lots of non-content words to create longer sentences? Yes, they said. Now we believe you. I tell you this story because I firmly believe that if Russian students learn all of the various principles I will touch on today in all of their English and academic writing courses in Russian universities, and particularly from Russian professors, not just from foreign professors, they will be able to make the shift to successful writing in English more easily, and with less resistance, and perhaps even with no resistance. If these professors can teach the Anglo-American approach to English academic writing as simply different, not inferior, and make the students practice it as part of their classwork, and I'll touch on this later, then these students will be well on their way to becoming successful writers in English. The theory of contrastive rhetoric applies to cross-cultural differences in writing. Differences in rhetorical approach, differences in organization, differences in emphasis, and most important, differences in the obligations of writers and readers. While we can define rhetoric as the way in which people put together language <coughs> to have an effect on an audience, each audience has certain expectations of rhetorical structure based on the traditional forms in their own culture. Finnish researcher Ulla Connor, in her book, Contrastive Rhetoric, writes, and I quote, Contrastive rhetoric maintains that language and writing are cultural phenomena. As a direct consequence, each language has rhetorical conventions unique to it. Furthermore, and this is most important, furthermore, the linguistic and rhetorical conventions of the first language interfere with writing in the second language." Unquote. In other words, to quote a psychologist friend of mine, if you're dancing with someone and stepping on his or her feet, dancing faster won't help. You're doing the wrong dance. You have to learn to dance differently. Not surprisingly, then, of all known rhetorical styles in the world, English has the most linear approach with a clear beginning, middle, and end, each following directly, clearly, precisely, and logically from the other. Most European languages, and Russian in particular, will allow more digressions. And just to give you an idea, uh, if you can see me, I'm going to have to use my hands for this. Uh, an American about 80, 100 years ago, an American linguist came up with symbolic notations for argumentative styles in various linguistic cultures. So for example, in the Middle East, in Hebrew, Arabic, Amharic, you start your subject, and then you go from 0 degrees to 180, 0 to 180, 0 to 180, and you conclude for one side or the other, and there is no gray in the middle. If you're arguing in Norway, it's all gray in the middle, and there are no polar positions. If you are arguing in Chinese, uh, Japanese, or Korean, to go straight to the point is very barbaric and uncivilized, so you work your way around to the point. In the uh, Romance languages, Italian, Spanish, Portuguese, French, you begin a subject, and then you digress. And then you come back, and then you go and talk about something else. You don't say why, well, you just do it, and you come back. In Russian, you start your subject, and you really excuse me, digress, and then you really digress. And the example I give when teaching is, I think, of uh, the brothers Karamazov, and how in the middle of the book there's the Grand Inquisitor. And when I was a teenager reading it in English, I thought, wait a minute, what happened to the story? What's this book doing here? How did it get here? Did I miss a page? What happened? It's a different way of thinking and writing. 
So, what do you think English looks like? Anybody? Do you want to guess? What, what, what would our new English look like? What would the symbol be? Yes. Okay, straight line with an arrow at the bottom. Absolutely. It's totally linear, but like an arrow, it's aiming at a target. And you can't afford to go from side to side to side when you're aiming, or you'll never hit the target. So English is aiming at a target. Um, if the writer heads straight for it. All theories, all other methods, the successes or limits of all previous scholarships, all have to be interwoven in the right place for that arrow to meet, to reach the target. And the target is always the well-proved conclusion of the writer's argument, okay? where the writer is heading. Now, uh, this is going to sound like a digression, but it isn't. I had just returned from a holiday in Gorni Altai, hiking and camping with friends along the rivers Trulishman and Katong. The river Trulishman flows down from a high mountain lake, flows into Lake Sovietskaya, and flows out as Bia. The river Katun flows down from the, racial, uh, the glacial melt of the Lucha, the highest mountain in Siberia, and flows over 700 kilometers gathering strain before it joins Bia in Bisk to create the great river of Western Siberia. I think that just as every river has a clear direction, Every English argument has a clear direction, and like the tributaries of a great river, like the rivers Akhem and Koksa and the 800 other rivers flowing into and feeding Katun, every um, necessary part of an argument feeds in, like a tributary, into the main argument where it is necessary to add strength and clarity to the direction which is the purpose, the conclusions of an argument. And I think the challenge for both Russian scholars and Russian teachers of English writing is to learn precisely when, where, and how those tributaries need to enter the argument. And the more that these scholars and teachers study the best writing in the best journals, the better they will be able to see the patterns and show their students how to do the same in their own writing. So, again, if English writers wish to bring in an external point and show how it bears on the subject, they have to tell the reader that such a digression is coming, why it is coming, when it is over, and what purpose it served so that it ties into that straight direction of that arrow. This telling is called framing, that is, contextualized everything contextualizing everything and walking the reader through one's thinking. And good framing must appear in all parts of an English paper. The use of the topic sentence in paragraphs, of the topic paragraph in sections, and of the purpose statement in an introduction. The other two keys to English argumentation are analysis, the breaking down of things and ideas into clear, meaningful, connected parts, and synthesis, the combining of diverse elements into a coherent whole, a coherent argument. Thus, the most important point that Russian universities need their scholars to know about publishing internationally is that they must follow Aristotle's empiricism, the proving of a point with empirical research, whether, that, whether it's data-based quantitative work or interview-based qualitative work in the social sciences or a reinterpretation of a critical event in history. Focusing on developing new theories with no carefully supported grounding in past earlier theory will not work. Interesting but poorly argued essays about a topic, or summaries of previous research, or ruminations on a subject of interest to the writer for the writer's own purposes will never survive the anonymous peer review process and are indeed likely to receive what we call desk rejects. That is, they are immediately rejected without being sent out for review. And why? Simply, well, there may be five reasons, or four. One is that they are not written as proofs or based on proofs. 
Two, because too many of them offer unsupported conclusions with all the necessary details in the writer's head, but not in the paper. Three, because international journals want well-supported empirical research. And four, because some of these theoretical papers uh, do not refer to the literature and prove step by step and detail by detail that the paper offers something new and essential to the field, something missing from the literature. And the literature, which we always put in quotes, the literature, kind of like God, the literature, <laughs> always means papers published in English in peer-reviewed journals. 